Welcome back, everyone, and thank you for joining the Fielding School of Public Health Continuing the Conversation webinar. I'm Shweta Saraswat, Communications Officer at the Fielding School. The U.S. Department of Agriculture distilled the 2010 Dietary Guidelines for Americans into seven consumer-friendly messages highlighted on the website choosemyplate.gov. A distinctive feature of these new messages is a recommendation for Americans to fill half of their plate with fruits and vegetables. In this webinar, Dr. William McCarthy will discuss why increasing fruit and vegetable consumption is likely more beneficial to health than other traditional methods like calorie counting and reading the food label. Dr. McCarthy will also describe how trained community health workers are coaching low-income residents of East LA to make changes in their homes so that choosing healthier foods and increasing physical activity are both easier and more sustainable. If you have a question for Dr. McCarthy during or after the lecture, you can type it in the field of the bottom of the chat window. And you can see the chat window in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. OK, Dr. McCarthy, let's get started. Um, hello, welcome to the UCLA webinar, May 15th, 2014. My name is Bill McCarthy. I'm a professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management, and my title is Putting More Fruits and Vegetables on the Table in East LA and Why It Matters. I will talk first why putting more fruits and vegetables on everybody's table is important, and then I will say why it is particularly important to do this in East LA where 97% of the residents um, are Latino. So uh, I'll move on now. Um, so this slide shows a lot of fruits and vegetables. Uh, they're featured in the uh, 2010 Dietary Guidelines. Um, the 2010 Dietary Guidelines for Americans is the consensus gold standard for nutrition advice in the US. And as um, you know, there are thousands of permutations of healthful dietary patterns around the globe, but a uh, few of them don't feature a range of colorful plant foods. That is a consistent feature of uh, most of the uh, healthful dietary patterns around the world. The greater the variety and the deeper the color, uh, typically uh, the better the nutrition. Uh, the next slide shows my plate. Uh, the 2010 White House Childhood Obesity Task Force released a report prioritizing the strategies for accelerating progress in combating child obesity, which has tripled in the last 20 years. From this report came a replacement of the familiar food pyramid with an icon represented by a colorful plate. Most noteworthy about this new icon is that it supported filling half of the typical plate, whether at breakfast, lunch, or dinner, with some combination of fruits and vegetables with a small preference for vegetables over fruit. Although not apparent from the icon, the text of the 2010 Dietary Guidelines made clear that half of all grain-rich foods should be made with whole grains. So here are, if you go to the Choose um, My Plate .gov website. Um, here are seven selected messages for consumers. Um, now, it's noteworthy that the top two uh, messages are holdovers from the past. Uh, they recommend uh, counting your calories and portion control. But the fact is that these past messages have uh, not been sustainable. Uh, Americans have continued to gain weight. So there has to be a, a more effective dietary approach to controlling weight. Um, the next slide shows uh, the plate. You know, the, the plate as a, a basis for making choices uh, is not new. In fact, the United Kingdom preceded us by a number of years in uh, recommending the eat well plate to its citizens as a way of making healthier choices. Now, um, one distinction between the Europeans and the Americans when counting servings of uh, vegetables is that the Europeans uh, tend to distinguish more than Americans do uh, between starchy vegetables like potatoes and uh, more colorful, more nutrient-rich uh, vegetables like tomatoes, squash, and uh, your fresh fruit. 
and um, that, that's created some measurement problems when trying to compare Europeans versus Americans. And it should be known that as, as poor as the uh, number of vegetable choices may be among Americans, uh, the fact is half of them are, are potatoes. So if you take potatoes away from Americans, they're looking especially poor. So uh, these new consumer guidelines include three which um, are foods to increase. And, and this is new. American citizens are not used to having their government tell them that in order to better control their waistline, they need to eat more. Uh, to eat more. Uh, in fact, the usual message has been, whatever you're eating, eat less. And uh, as I said, uh, empirically, we've found that that message seems not to be sustainable. Americans show amazing willpower and can reduce their caloric intake for a while. But absent a qualitative change in the nature of the foods that they eat, uh, they, they seem to relapse and end up overeating calories again. So uh, the first message is uh, make half your plate fruits and vegetables. And that, that is the focus of today's talk. But I did want to say uh, some things about the other messages. Uh, make at least half your grains whole grain. Uh, most Americans are consuming highly refined uh, grains. And uh, they're doing a poor job of adhering to this half a grain. Uh, half, half your grains should be whole grain choices. Uh, at best, we're, we have one of our uh, six choices being whole grain. We need to, to do better than that. Um, also, Americans do consume a fair amount of milk, and that's recommended by the dietary guidelines, but not in the whole fat form. Uh, there's no essential need for the saturated fat uh, found in, in cow's milk. And uh, so cow's milk can be good for you, particularly for the calcium, uh, but um, the best form is either fat-free or low-fat. And uh, if we consume more fat-free or low-fat milk, we may be better off in terms of uh, regulating our weight. So foods to reduce, um, you know, at, at first blush, it may seem um, odd that the White House Task Force on Childhood Obesity would, would focus on sodium as an issue. Uh, sodium is non-caloric. It, it's, um, you know, it, it's a taste enhancer. Uh, but because it's non-caloric, why should that have an impact on the waistline? Well, the fact of the matter is that uh, most of the sodium that Americans consume, in fact, well, m most of the sodium that they consume comes from uh, processed food. So sodium turns out to be a marker for processed food. And uh, it's, it's been very consistently demonstrated that uh, as Americans increase their consumption of processed food, uh, their waistline expands. It's a dose-response relationship. So uh, if a marker for fast food is sodium, that means that the more sodium they eat, then the more likely it is that they're relying on uh, processed food rather than minimally processed food from Mother Nature, uh, such as fruits and vegetables. So sodium turns out, at least uh, as a correlate, uh, to be an important marker. And then this other message, drink water instead of sugary beverages. This is the first time that the US government has come straight out and said, uh, you know, limit your sugary drinks. And if you can bring it down to zero, that's best. Drink water instead of sugary drinks. Uh, it took some political courage <laughs> for the USDA to come out with such a strong statement. But they, they could do so because the science is incontrovertible. Uh, drinking more sugary beverages is consistently associated with increased risk of unwanted weight gain. So Americans need to do whatever they can to uh, decrease their consumption of sugary beverages. Now, you've all probably heard about the DASH diet. Uh, the DASH diet, that DASH stands for Dietary Approaches to Stopping Hypertension. Uh, it's, it's been tested in um, multiple investigations using multi-centered trials, um, very rigorous science. And the results are quite consistent, that when you adopt the DASH diet, uh, good things happen, particularly with respect to blood pressure. Uh, you can see reductions in blood pressure that are um, not dissimilar from the reductions you might get with high power drugs, uh, but only through using diet. Without using any drugs, you can significantly reduce your blood pressure uh, 
And, and how do you do that? Well, the main features of the DASH diet that help to reduce blood pressure are to uh, increase to at least eight servings of fruits and vegetables per day, uh, one, one consumption of fruits and vegetables. And eight, it represents a doubling since the average consumption uh, of fruits and vegetables by Americans is four, eight is double that. Now, the DASH diet is more than just eating more fruits and vegetables, although I think that's the defining feature. Um, other other uh, constituents of the DASH diet include a reduction in, in fat by a small amount and um, an increase in low-fat dairy. And then uh, noteworthy is a reduction in sodium down to 1,500 milligrams of sodium a day. Um, a, a note about the sodium standard. Uh, 1,500 sounds low. The, the average American consumption is now 3,400. And uh, so 1,500 is well below that, less than half. Um, and 1,500 is currently the recommended uh, maximum for all Americans over the age of 50 and African Americans, uh, which leaves 43% of Americans who can go up to the higher maximum of 2,300. The 2300 is still well below the 3400 that all Americans uh, are consuming. And as I noted before, uh, most of the sodium that Americans are getting uh, comes from processed food. Uh, in fact, 70% comes from uh, foods that are found in cans and boxes and plastic wrap. And um, uh, very little comes naturally in the food. Uh, and, and very little, surprisingly, comes from the salt shaker. It's mostly from the processed food. And the most effective way to reduce uh, sodium is to move away from processed food. And uh, obviously, that, that means eating a lot more of Mother Nature's minimally processed uh, products. So uh, here's the Mediterranean pyramid. So uh, the DASH diet, um, many people, many nutrition experts agree, uh, resembles the Mediterranean diet. And, and some of the lessons we're now learning about the DASH diet and how healthful it is, uh, not just uh, for reducing blood pressure, but for our waistline and for reducing our risk of heart disease. Um, we, we already know from what we know about the Mediterranean diet. So uh, it, it's worth spending a, a few minutes talking about uh, some of the health benefits of uh, migrating from a Western diet to, uh, and sorry about all these numbers, <laughs> to uh, a Mediterranean diet. So this is a study. Uh, these numbers come from a study conducted in Italy uh, with uh, adults, healthy adults, um, who uh, were at some risk of, of uh, cardiovascular disease. And half of them were assigned randomly to uh, adopting a Mediterranean diet. And the other half were told, continue eating your usual pattern. And in Europe, unfortunately, the usual pattern now uh, is, is closer to what the American usual pattern is and, and not uh, the traditional Mediterranean diet. And I want you to particularly uh, focus on these uh, red colored, uh, these, these circles, uh, pointing out the gram weight of the fruits and vegetables at baseline. And then um, I'll show on the next slide um, with uh, other colored circles uh, what the change is at follow-up. And uh, so in the Mediterranean condition, you'll notice that the gram weight of fruits and vegetables went from about 200 grams to more than double that, 487 grams, a huge increase. Now, much like the DASH diet, it represented a doubling of fruit and vegetable intake uh, for people in Italy uh, adhering to the traditional um, Mediterranean diet. That resulted in a doubling, near doubling of the fiber intake. But look in the far right hand corner, uh, that circle there, uh, it's a little hard to see, but it says negative 100. That means that by doubling their consumption of fruits and vegetables in the Mediterranean arm with hardly any discernible increase in fruits and vegetables in the control arm, the Mediterranean group enjoyed a 100 calorie per day deficit. You know, it's, it's, it's counterintuitive. Eat more, <laughs> weigh less. But that will be the theme, as you'll see, with uh, the DASH diet as well. Now, now parenthetically, um, a recent a randomized control trial uh, reported in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at um, multi-year outcomes to a Mediterranean versus other diet approach. And in the short run, it looked like an Atkins-type low-carbohydrate diet uh, yielded 
more weight loss than the uh, Mediterranean diet. But at long-term follow-up, um, the Mediterranean diet turned out to be more sustainable. And I'm going to explain later why a diet that features a doubling of fruits and vegetables should be more sustainable than other dietary approaches to trying to control weight. So here we are with uh, some results from one of the DASH trials. And it should be noted that uh, six months was the longest that they could keep these participants. Many of them had been initially diagnosed with hypertension. But for six months, it is ethically OK for um, a health professional to tell them, hey, let's try to reduce this through lifestyle change alone. And then we'll um, prescribe the drugs. So at, at six months follow-up at that point for those patients that had not successfully reduced their blood pressure to a healthy level, then uh, the health professionals participating in the study had to um, allocate, had to prescribe drugs. And so that was the end of the drug-free diet interval. But uh, it's, it's nonetheless uh, noteworthy to review the, the results of the six-month trial. Now, mind you, the DASH trial was not intended to be a weight loss trial. It was focused on reducing hypertension, hypertension risk. And, and so the weight loss benefit is, is a surplus benefit, something that was kind of an accident, um, although it was desirable. So what you notice here is that um, there is a 13-pound drop in the Mediterranean, I mean, in the, uh, in the DASH uh, condition compared to the, the usual care condition. Um, so th those in the usual care condition knew that they were being watched, and that motivated them to watch their diet carefully. And so they, <laughs> they had a two-pound drop in six months, but that's negligible. So the 13 pounds represents a 6% decrease in body weight. And I'll point out later why that 6% is, is significant. So uh, the next slide shows the same results uh, for the same participants, but shows what happened to the gram weight of the food that th they were consuming. So on the DASH trial, relative to baseline, uh, there was a 24% increase in gram weight. So it, it was like 250 grams of extra food a day that they could eat relative to the you know, usual care condition where there was a negligible change. So they are indeed eating quite a bit more food than they were uh, prior to the intervention. And uh, what, what did that do to their caloric intake? Well, it reduced it by 15%. You know, this is really quite amazing. <laughs> so that, uh, the, you know, the study protocol required that they eat substantially more food than they had been accustomed to. Uh, you know, you, you can thank the, the, these participants for their willingness to sacrifice on behalf of science. <laughs> but obviously, if you're putting 24% more food in your body on an everyday basis, uh, there's less likelihood of spending most of the day thinking about food because you're constantly hungry. How can you be hungry when you're full? <laughs> so there was a follow-on trial by some of the investigators who had l looked at uh, the weight control benefits, the weight loss benefits of the DASH trial. And um, so these same investigators did a one-year trial with overweight women to see if adding fruits and vegetables to a traditional restricted fat uh, diet approach to weight loss would make a difference. And in particular, they were looking at the effect on everyday hunger. And uh, it's noteworthy that not only did uh, the participants getting the fruit and vegetable uh, supplement to the fat restricted diet do better in terms of successful weight loss at one year follow up, but in the process of achieving a better result, they reported significantly less hunger than those on the traditional fat-restricted diet. So from a behavioral point of view, it's quite clear that supplementing a diet, as Weight Watchers does with its dietary plan, with um, more fruits and vegetables uh, seems to be more sustainable in part because it's associated with less everyday hunger than is the traditional calorie restriction approach. So to make, to make this really con concrete, I'm going to uh, pick on one fruit, um, the strawberry. And I, I consider the strawberry a, a satiety champion uh, because it's so full of water. The, the, the secret ingredient to fruits and vegetables that helps people full on fewer calories is water. 
Uh, generally, fruits and vegetables are 75 to 92 percent by weight water. So here we have a food that's 92 percent uh, by weight water. Uh, people are surprised to hear that on a hot summer day, they can replenish their lost the, the, the water that they lost in sweat. They can replenish it more successfully by consuming strawberries than by consuming uh, the same weight uh, of Coca-Cola. You know, Coca-Cola is a liquid, and strawberries are a solid. They tell me, and so obviously you can't replenish the lost uh, water by eating strawberries. Well, it turns out in terms of water content, strawberries have more than sugar-sweetened Coca-Cola because 10% of the weight of the Coca-Cola is sugar. It's not water. <laughs> so, uh, but be that as it may, what I want you to remember about this slide is that there are 22 calories per serving. Of, of strawberries. And the US, USDA defines a uh, serving of strawberries as three ounces of strawberries, so half a cup. So the next slide. Uh, you can be forgiven if, if you're a little confused because some of the ads imply that fruit roll-ups are fruit. You know, people who say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm eating the five a day, I'm eating my fruit roll-ups. Well, no. Fruit roll-ups are so highly processed, they're, they're indistinguishable from <laughs> plain sugar. Um, but uh, be that as it may, uh, look at the calorie density of fruit roll-ups. Uh, it's quite a bit more calorie dense than, uh, uh, than the strawberries. In fact, it, uh, the calorie density is 13 times greater than the original fruit from which these fruit roll-ups uh, were derived. Uh, and, and, and please note here that the average serving size is just one ounce, not the three ounces we saw with the strawberries. And that one ounce has 110 calories, not the 22 calories that we talked about. So I think you're getting the idea. <laughs> but just to bring it home, here we have a slide representing one ounce of fruit roll-ups and then the 13 ounces of strawberries that one would have to eat to get the same number of calories that you get in one ounce. Now, which is it easier to overeat, the fruit roll-ups or the strawberries? Well, it turns out there is, you know, the nutritionists call this phenomenon sensory specific satiety. And basically what that means is that if there's a food that, you've, that you like, that you intrinsically like, but you're now having more of it, the more you eat, uh, the less uh, appetizing it feels, the more satiated you'll feel for that particular taste. And, and the result is that if you try to eat you know, the, the 4.3 servings of strawberries that equates to the one serving of fruit roll-ups uh, in order to match the caloric intake, uh, most people would poop out before they get to the, you know, uh, the, the 0.8 pounds of strawberries required uh, to consume. So one serving, it, it's easy, it's, you know, it's delectable. But the second serving, people are already getting tired. By the fourth serving, a lot of people are saying, hey, this is unpleasant. <laughs> I give up. And, and that illustrates why it's, it's so hard or so much harder to overeat calories when you rely on Mother Nature's produce rich in fiber and water than if you rely on human-made products like fruit roll-ups. So the next slide shows the carrot. And we know there are good things about carrots, particularly the beta carotene. Um, but carrots metabolically have very different effects depending on how processed the carrot is prior to consumption. So raw carrots are more satiating than shredded carrots. And shredded carrots provide a greater sense of fullness for the same weight of carrots than carrot juice. So if you put a, a whole carrot into the blender and turn on the blender, Almost all of it turns into juice. So most of what's in the juice was in the original carrot. But metabolically, they have very different effects, in part because when you have a pre-processed, pre-digested food like carrot juice, it has no staying power in the stomach. Part of what makes a food satiating is that it'll sit in the stomach for a while. But if it's a juice, it just sluices right through the stomach and gets deposited in the small intestine very rapidly. And the rapidity with which nutrients reach the small intestine makes a difference in terms of its glycemic load. And that does affect appetite. It affects the ability of the body to monitor calories. And uh, so for, for Americans concerned with weight control, the less processed the food, uh, the more success that they will enjoy in filling up 
sooner on, on fewer calories and uh, reducing, therefore, their risk of over, over consuming calories. Now, <clears throat> it's not just science that's been paying attention to this. Uh, U.S. News and World Report, which is not a scientific journal, uh, nonetheless has year after year been ranking diets as to which are the best. And the top ranked commercial diet is Weight Watchers. But if you look at uh, the blue names in the top of this graph, uh, I mean this uh, slide, it uh, notes that the raw food diet came in number two. So the raw food diet is a, a, an excellent way to go. And parenthetically, for weight loss, and, and there are different rankings, but for weight loss, U.S. News and World Report ranked the DASH diet, which remember was not designed to be a weight loss diet, ranked it 12th best. Uh, but in terms of overall nutrition, it ranked the DASH diet number one. For, for all over um, good nutrition, uh, the DASH diet is viewed by U.S. News and World Report as the single best dietary approach that Americans have. So <clears throat> unfortunately, I have to, you know, I'm an academic. I have to go through some, uh, some data uh, to talk about why this is important in terms of uh, potential health outcomes down the road. So I'm going to talk about first uh, the prevalence of obesity and then talk about uh, diabetes as one of uh, the feared consequences of uh, unchecked obesity. So in, in this slide, we see that uh, U.S. adults uh, uh, vary by ethnic group in terms of their risk of obesity, uh, with Asians at uh, clearly discernibly lower risk, and, and there are dietary reasons why that's true. Um, whites are um, also at significant risk, but less, less so than African Americans and Latinos. So uh, these are adults. So mind you that uh, Latinos already look bad when you look at the adults. But now if we move to the next slide, which shows children, now Latinos are the worst off, uh, even worse than African Americans on average, and particularly the boys. Uh, and, and the Asians, the Asian boys, uh, it's quite striking uh, how much different their risk is relative to the, to the girls. And when I saw this, I said, wow, there needs to be some research as to what's going on between the genders among uh, Asians. But uh, some similar dynamic seems to be happening with Latinos. So uh, it's a little curious to me why there's this gender difference. Uh, more research is clearly needed. So <clears throat> and now we have a consequence of uh, obesity, namely diabetes, as you may know type 2 diabetes, which uh, at one time was called adult onset diabetes. But now half of all diabetes in kids is the so-called adult diabetes. So they changed the terminology to type 2 diabetes uh, to allow for lots of kids to have so-called adult onset diabetes. And um, as we saw from the previous slides, uh, Latinos uh, are at significantly higher risk. Um, most adults with type 2 diabetes also have obesity. The two are uh, quite closely interconnected. And uh, if, if Latinos want to reduce their risk of diabetes, they need to do something about their waistline. So that was diabetes incidence. And just to hammer home the, fa the fact that uh, you know obesity leading to diabetes is not a good thing. Uh, these are the death rates associated with diabetes. And quite clearly, uh, Latinos are dying at higher rates prematurely uh, because of their expanded waistlines that put them at risk of diabetes. So here we have some recent data that uh, colleagues uh, and I uh, published um, on uh, using California data on um, the reported sugar beverage intake. Um, and, and this is in the context of the American Heart Association in its uh, 20 uh, 2020 um, impact goals, uh, it, it recommended that Americans limit their consumption of sugary beverages to no more than three 12 ounce uh, beverage containers a week. No more than that a week. And, uh, you know, we, we all know folks who <laughs> drink more than, more than that in a day. Um, and uh, we find that uh, Latinos, uh, as I had alluded to earlier, uh, seem to have a higher uh, rate of sugary beverage consumption. Uh, among the foreign-born, it's particularly high, 60%. And even among the U.S.-born, it's 50%. So the good news is that acculturation seems to be a, a somewhat protective for Latinos. Uh, 
Um, so second generation is drinking a little less of the sugary beverages uh, than the first generation. Uh, my guess from having talked to, to other uh, folks in the field is that the high sugary beverage consumption from uh, immigrants from Mexico, for instance, reflects a past where <clears throat> the water was, was often polluted. And so the safer beverage was one that was already bottled and manufactured and therefore exposed to heat. And heat kills the bugs in, in whatever water was used to make the beverage. <clears throat> so um, that may explain why the rates are so high initially with the immigrant Latinos. Uh, but the US born Latinos are still drinking far higher rates. There seems to be a cultural imperative. Um, you may know that uh, Latinos, if, if they're um, serving as hosts at, at their home, to offer a guest water is insulting. Uh, it's considered uh, a no-no uh, in, in the Latino culture. And uh, somehow we need to change cultural norms in the Latino community uh, to make it more acceptable to serve something like tea uh, instead of um, uh, a sugar-sweetened beverage. And of course, by tea, I mean unsweetened tea. Um, so when we look uh, at other data um, in the same publication, looking at California data, um, we were looking at um, what is the percent of various ethnic groups who report eating less than one serving a day of combined fruits and vegetables. You know, that's, that's eating almost nothing in the way of fruits and vegetables. And uh, it's, it's shocking, but almost a third of US-born Latinos are getting by a whole day with not a single fruit, not a single vegetable. And uh, you know, there's something wrong with this picture. Um, and it's, it's not as if uh, their, their ancestors uh, weren't eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, as, as uh, a later slide will show. And unfortunately, you know, here's the health consequences of these dietary choices. So Latinos have um, high rates of diabetes associated with the sugary beverage consumption and um, the uh, very low rate of consuming fruits and vegetables. And um, th this is true of both the foreign-born and the US-born. Um, the US-born Asians uh, are even worse off, and, and that's really striking. And I, I don't believe people are attending enough to the challenge among Asians. But for my talk, we're, we're focusing on Latinos. So in a future talk, maybe I'll <laughs> address US-born Latinos. So finally, uh, I get to talk about uh, the work that I'm doing in East LA with many colleagues uh, from USC and UCLA. And um, as you may have heard, I'm, I'm co-director of the Center for, Health, uh, for uh, Population Health and Health Disparities. It's funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And uh, we were funded to reduce uh, the cardiovascular risk of the residents in uh, East LA. And um, be before I talk about what we're doing in East LA, I did want to get into uh, some of the demographic characteristics. But uh, please note um, the uh, crisscrossing of freeways uh, through East LA. It's, um, you know, it's unfortunate. You know, they're landlocked, and uh, they're beset by the pollution from cars and all the surrounding freeways. So uh, it doesn't make for the greatest physical environment. But on the other hand, it's a very vibrant community. And uh, there are good reasons for why immigrants have made it such a popular way station on the way to uh, increasing prosperity and eventually uh, uh, migration out of East LA into uh, wealthier neighborhoods. So here are the numbers. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, 97% of East LA is Latino as compared with 38% of the population in California being Latino. So very heavily Latino. And of that, almost, most of them are Mexican-American. So 88% of the population in East LA is, uh, has roots in, in Mexico. Um, and as I mentioned, a lot of immigrants make their home in East LA. So 43% um, report that they're foreign-born. Um, and when we ask them, what, what language do you use at home? 88% are using a language other than English. So usually that means Spanish. Uh, only 5% have a BA degree, which compares to 31% average for Californians across the state. So a uh, very low rate of higher education. Median income, the per capita income is less than half of that 
uh, across the state of California. Uh, despite this fact, uh, look at the median value of owner-occupied housing. Uh, it's 307,000 compared to 383,000. You know, that's not that much lower than the uh, California average. So the question is, how, how do people in East LA afford to live there? Well, the answer is uh, in, in the lowest um, row there, persons per household, you'll see that there's 40% increased uh, population density within the homes in East LA. So with more uh, wage earners uh, paying per um, uh, per household, uh, you end up uh, collectively being able to afford the high housing prices in East LA. So, a as I mentioned earlier, I, I, um, the Latin American ancestors were eating lots of fruits and vegetables, even more proportionally speaking than the Mediterranean diet uh, recommended. So, it's certainly within the cultural history of most Latinos uh, to eat lots of fruits and vegetables. And uh, so the dearth of fruit and vegetable consumption is, is not uh, culturally consistent with uh, the Latino heritage. And so we need to get back to these uh, better features of the Latino heritage uh, in any way that we can. Now my, my colleagues and I um, had tried earlier approaches to increasing fruit and vegetable intake. Um, so our, our first attempt, and, and this was with uh, patients at um, community clinics that, that uh, uh, provided access to low-income and uninsured individuals to provide them with access to health care. And so um, after getting the assent uh, of the people in the waiting room to be part of our telephone lifestyle uh, counseling intervention, we had master's level uh, health educators uh, get on the phone multiple times, in this case it was four times, and uh, encourage uh, the participants to eat more fruits and vegetables. And it had a short-term, uh, two-month uh, effect, so there is a demonstrably uh, increased consumption of, of fruits and vegetables on the plate. Um, but as you can see, we lost that benefit, a six-month follow-up um, after the counseling calls had stopped. So uh, that clearly didn't have staying power. Uh, so we then tried again uh, in a second study and this time we used, instead of master's level bilingual um, health educators, we used community health workers, promotores. And uh, so we were more successful in, in uh, increasing substantially fruit and vegetable intake. And this time it stayed higher, uh, but there was some, uh, some loss of the gain at uh, six month follow up. So we, we knew we needed to do more. And moreover, the, the absolute amount was still not enough to meet the, um, the, the, the bottom, uh, the, the minimum uh, increase, uh, which was five a day. We, we really wanted them to eat five fruits and vegetables a day. And uh, if, if you read the dietary guidelines carefully, you know that the, the average adult American woman on a 2,000 calorie per, per day diet should be consuming nine combined servings of fruits and vegetables a day, not just the five. But hey, if we can get the five, that's already a big plus. So um, this is a um, the, the only study that we could find in the literature uh, pre prior to ours that uh, talked about going into the home and re-engineering the contents of the home to make it supportive of healthier choices and using, uh, in this case, weight as an outcome. And uh, Rena Wing and her associates, including Gorin and Raynor, um, they demonstrated that uh, by uh, eliminating problem foods uh, like chips and sodas, and, and by eliminating, I mean every month, you know, for, for six months, they'd go in and they'd use a checklist, and if there are any problem foods, they got, them, got rid of them entirely. The house was cleaned of uh, chips, sodas, hamburgers, uh, cheese, uh, all these problem foods, and uh, the, the, the participants were reminded that they were supposed to be uh, filling up the refrigerator with fruits and vegetables and with uh, other good stuff. So, um, so here's our study now. And uh, this is our blueprint for how to make your home um, more supportive of the healthy choices that the dietary guidelines encourage people to make. So I'm not going to go into the details here. You can read this at your leisure. But basically, we want people to change the composition of uh, their refrigerators so that uh, it resembles more closely what was featured on your plate. 
and it's not just uh, the visual cues. Uh, and, and indeed, when I say visual cues, I also include exercise. So we do tell them put your ex exercise equipment conspicuously by the front door. Uh, also noteworthy, we tell them move your TV set out of the kitchen because there's a very consistent uh, relationship between having the TV in the kitchen and uh, unwanted weight gain. Uh, but particularly for people who watch uh, while they're watch TV while they're eating. That's not a good combination. Um, so it's not just visual cues, but it's also uh, the, the routine household practices. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of these household practices listed on this slide are related to what, what has been discussed previously. But something that might strike people as, you know, sort of out of sync with what's been discussed earlier is this uh, recommendation, number three, to eat healthy dinner with family members present uh, three plus times a week. Um, the more often that family members uh, get together and, and talk with each other over dinner, the, the healthier the family is in a variety of respects, um, but including uh, diabetes risk and obesity risk. And why might that, why might that be? Well, the alternative for many uh, families uh, where you have two, you know, certainly in single parent families, but uh, in low income families where uh, people have two jobs and they don't have time to sit down with the, the family and you end up eating a lot of takeout. And the families that are not sitting down and eating together often rely on takeout and takeout food uh, tends to be highly processed and uh, excessively calorically dense. Um, and then the other thing to note here, uh, the last one is uh, to keep the environment smoke free. I mean, what is what is smoke free? Uh, what does a smoke free environment have to do with supporting uh, more fruits and vegetables? Well, it turns out that smokers not only differ in their lifestyle choice in terms of you know, whether they like to use psychoactive substances or not, but it turns out that they exercise less and they're very averse to eating fruits and um, they don't like vegetables um, much either. And so we find empirically that uh, the household that tolerates smoke is a household that also is not very supportive of uh, other healthier choices like eating fruits and vegetables. So just a few uh, pictures uh, to show off some of our uh, really superb interveners. Uh, that's a picture of uh, Brenda Manzanares uh, talking about my plate to a participant in the far right. Uh, and the person in the middle is Rosalba Kane, our very talented uh, community health worker. Uh, both Brenda and Rosalba are bicultural, bilingual, and have been very well received by the residents in East LA, in part because they're recognized as bona fide uh, members of the community. And uh, so if we're going to have an impact, I'm sure we're having an impact through them. Uh, we use a traffic light dietary pattern. Green dots mean these are everyday foods. Uh, red dots are foods that should be limited. We recommend to no more than once a month, put it in the far back of the refrigerator where it's hard to reach. And then yellow is intermediate foods. And we do this not only in the refrigerator, but in the uh, pantry as well. So uh, for the breakfast cereals, if it's sugary, uh, if it's sugar frosted flakes, then uh, that gets a red. You know, you can have it, but uh, once a month is probably <laughs> the limit. And as I mentioned, we, we believe in uh, the importance of physical activity. Physical activity is part of the equation. How do you generate uh, increased appetite for water bearing foods? Well, you do it by expending uh, water through sweat in exercise. And uh, that remains a proposition that, that uh, needs more testing, but I believe it's true. So in sum, uh, community-based participatory research, home environment focused lifestyle change intervention carried out by trained promotorists is possible, is well justified by the science, and can be and has been so far well received by the community. Uh, whether our study will be effective in reducing obesity-related disease, uh, relative to an attention control condition that we won't know until we collect our, all of our 12-month data, which uh, we'll have done by this fall. So um, I'm now interested in receiving questions, if people have any. Thank you, Dr. McCarthy. We actually have a, a question from an audience member about um, could you discuss the availability of fresh and healthy foods, fruits and vegetables in East LA and how that can contribute to the success of interventions like the ones you've been talking about? Uh, that turns out, somewhat to my surprise, uh, to be a hard question to answer, in part because uh, we discovered uh, inadvertently that um, there is uh, 
an underground economy of um, backyard uh, garden vegetables being traded for other items, uh, you know, like gas sometimes or labor. And um, so we don't have a full fix on what's available. Uh, <clears throat> but we do know from other research looking at the retail environment that most of the food sources in East LA are, are corner stores. They're small corner stores that don't have a good range of fruits and vegetables. In fact, some people have uh, called East LA a food desert. Uh, a more correct term is food swamp because it's swamped by all these uh, ready to eat uh, fast food sources and a uh, few, few sources of fruits and vegetables. And what fruits and vegetables are available often are in canned form, swimming in syrup rather than the fresh variety that's highly perishable. Um, and the few supermarkets that are there um, have large parking lots, which make them inaccessible to people on walkers or baby carriages. And so it turns out that um, they're, they're designed more for cars and not for, not for the uh, residents who don't have cars um, uh, living around the supermarket. So the supermarkets are not necessarily the answer either. Um, so, but uh, that being said, it's, it's still clear that um, the residents in what, on, on the west side of Los Angeles have much better access uh, to fruits and vegetables than do the, the residents of East LA. So we need to do more as a society to make fruits and vegetables uh, more available through farmers markets, through community gardens, through encouraging uh, urban agriculture. You know, there are a lot of backyards that are not being used in East LA. Uh, that could be used uh, to grow edible crops. We have another question from Becky in the audience. Um, she wants to know if you can provide a little more detail on the control group in your East LA study and also um, some more detail on the outcome measures that you're collecting. Yeah, our primary outcome measure, uh, because it's funded by the Heart and Lung and Blood Institute, um, is looking at uh, vascular function. And in particular, we're looking at um, the stiffness of the arteries. Uh, the stiffer your artery, the more heart prone you are to heart disease. And we find that it's a very sensitive marker to lifestyle risk. So people who are eating lots of fruits and vegetables have more pliable, uh, younger um, functioning arteries. And so we can measure that. Um, <clears throat> uh, with, with respect to the attention control condition, uh, we're using uh, cancer early detection as uh, the health education that we compare with um, our lifestyle change intervention. And uh, the participants in the cancer uh, early detection arm are very appreciative of the information that we're providing. And ethically, we feel more comfortable uh, not simply depriving them <laughs> of the lifestyle change in the intervention. And I should add that it's a wait list control intervention as well, meaning that uh, those assigned to the cancer early detection arm will eventually get the gym in the bag and get much of the advice that we're currently providing to the participants in the lifestyle change arm. So eventually all the participants uh, will benefit. Um, we have another question from um, an audience member, and it's something I've heard um, other parents think about also. Are fruits and vegetables exchangeable on this on this new my plate? Because um, you know a lot of kids do get a lot of fruits, but they might not get enough vegetables. Uh, it's it's pretty clear that nutritionally speaking, uh, there's going to be more benefit to focusing more on the vegetables than on the fruit. But fruits are sweet, and uh, children have an easier time learning to like new fruits than uh, learning to like new vegetables. That being said, virtually all children can eventually come to like a much greater range of vegetables, but it takes 8 to 10 to 12 exposures before they come to like what they initially had actively disliked. And many parents, frankly, don't seem to have the patience, or for that matter, food service directors in the school district don't have the patience, because to have perfectly good food thrown away 8, 10 times before the kid finally says, oh, you know, I, I really like this, I'll eat all the rest, uh, you know, it, it does take some, uh, some resolution, but uh, we, we have to show some resolution in the face of the, the, the small ranges that our kids currently uh, have because, uh, you know, their, their risk of uh, unwanted weight gain and diabetes is going to be much higher than it should be as long as they dislike vegetables. We have a question from another audience member. What is the most common reason that participants give in your study um, in explaining why they don't have more fruits and vegetables in the fridge? Um, well, 
the perishability of the foods is, is one issue. Um, uh, for those of us who eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, we end up throwing some of it out, even though we initially liked it. Uh, you know, berries are particularly perishable. And uh, recently, uh, raspberries have been relatively cheap. But uh, my wife and I threw out uh, upwards of a third of the raspberries we purchased, even though you know, they were only a day old. And that's, you know, that reflects how quickly perishable they are. And, uh, you know, w one of the advantages of highly processed food is that they have long shelf lives. So for people who are really averse to, uh, in, in some sense, throwing away their food money, uh, you know, there's going to be a strong disincentive to favor highly processed long shelf life foods over the perishable foods. So I think that's that's a big part of it. Um, we have a question from an audience member about uh, the consumption of sugary drinks. You know, a lot of people have the habit of having a sugary drink a day. Um, do you have any advice in terms of weaning off of those drinks, um, maybe transitioning to alternatives like Splenda, Stevia, other um, sweeteners? You know, my view is that if you want to appreciate the taste of water more, you need to get out there and sweat. Uh, exercise is a great way of increasing your appreciation for tea, for fruits, for other things that are minimally sweetened relative to the highly sweetened concentrated juices uh, that you, you find uh, so prevalent. Uh, so uh, it's, it's not a matter of finding replacements. We, you know, too many Americans insist on a high level of sweetness when in fact if they exercised enough they would appreciate uh, the lower levels of sweetness that are in Mother Nature's products. So you've been talking about um, the low-income Latino family. How applicable are the results from your studies on other populations, um, people who have higher incomes or maybe um, second generation Asian Americans? Well, the obesity epidemic has spared no one. And uh, the highly educated, high-income Americans are far fatter today than they were uh, 20 years ago. So in, in many respects, uh, the low income, uh, our, our low income neighbors have been canaries in the coal mine. And uh, you know, their suffering is going to become the suffering of all Americans. And, and we see this in the CDC uh, maps uh, since 1985 showing the prevalence of obesity by state for all 50 states from 1985 to the present time. If you've not seen the sequence of slides, it's pretty amazing. Every state has become more obese. Every category uh, of income, of ethnicity, has increased in obesity. And uh, so uh, the advice that I'm making really applies to all of us. This is not strictly for low-income folks. All of us will benefit by eating more fruits and vegetables. And for those of us who, because of our income and education, already are eating quite a few servings of fruits and vegetables, uh, in order to keep the normal curve normal, <laughs> we're going to have to continue eating even more than we've been eating in the past. So some people may consider us uh, uh, fanatics on it, but in order to help all the rest, uh, some of us are going to have to uh, sacrifice and, and be on the high end of eating you know, 10, 12, 14 servings of fruits and vegetables a day. We have a follow-up on one of your previous answers um, talking about the short shelf life of fresh produce. Do you recommend to your study participants that they purchase frozen fruits or vegetables as an alternative? Yeah, many of them have limited fr freezer space, so that's not a practical option for, for many of them. But if they do have uh, freezer space, that's an excellent option. In fact, there are some products like fresh corn, for instance. Uh, fresh frozen corn has more vitamin C than the corn still in the husk that's been sitting for two days, uh, lying exposed to the ambient air um, in, in the grocery store. Uh, because uh, vitamin C being water soluble, you know, there's some moisture loss, and along with the moisture loss is some loss of vitamin C. So frozen can be a good option, but beware, read the ingredient list, because often they will insert gratuitously uh, sodium, and it really annoys me when, you know, I get, you know, fresh frozen vegetables, and then I see the added sodium. It's gratuitous, it's not needed, so uh, be careful. Great. We have a question from another audience member. If you could provide a little more information about the new dietary policy or sort of healthy eating policies in restaurants in LA County. Uh, yeah, um, I've been on the uh, policy um, council that, that has advised uh, that initiative. And I was a little critical of that initiative because it focuses 
uh, on the old pattern uh, of approaches to uh, restricting excess weight gain. And that's simply to calorically restrict what it is. So they weren't telling the restaurants to change the nature of the foods that they were offering to their patrons. Instead, they were asking the restaurants to provide a half-size portion as an option because so many portions are oversized. Uh, but not changing the nature is not going to solve the problem ultimately. So um, you know, I was a little critical on those grounds, but anything that makes people more aware of the importance of limiting excess consumption of ready-made prepared foods, I think, is, is good. So in that respect, I was happy to see that. It's a voluntary program, and uh, some restaurants like Subway's uh, has been very uh, enthusiastically supportive of this program, whereas uh, other restaurants have been uh, not so enthusiastic. Going back to your study, assuming that you find positive results when you analyze all of your 12-month follow-up data, what are some of the possible clinical implications of your findings? Well, obviously, that we need to do a better job of encouraging our patients to eat more fruits and vegetables. And uh, New York City, uh, as in, in, in many respects, uh, in, in recent years, thanks to former Mayor Bloomberg, uh, they have what's called a Healthy Bucks program where um, instead of prescribing uh, drugs right away, uh, when, uh, when providers are faced with patients who are clearly overweight and, and need to lose some of the excess weight, they provide them these coupons, these healthy bucks, which are redeemable uh, at any of the 140 uh, farmers markets that are found around Manhattan or, or other boroughs of, of New York City. And uh, it, you know, admittedly, it's testimonial. I haven't seen you know, good empirical evidence, but uh, testimonially, this has resulted in uh, successful uh, weight loss by many low-income patients who make good use of these coupons and are very appreciative of being given support to uh, increase their intake of fruits and vegetables. So we need initiatives like that. We need other initiatives like um, having uh, community health workers attached to our clinics serving as community navigators uh, so that when the provider prescribes eating more fruits and vegetables, this navigator can then uh, provide a lot of hand-holding to the, to the patient as to where to go, where, where to find the farmer's market, where, where to go to the YMCA to, to increase their physical activity level or the uh, community garden. Uh, we find that people who in, spend time in community gardens, uh, they eat significantly more fruits and vegetables than people who don't. So if you grow it, uh, you, you, you're going to eat more of it. In fact, uh, we find that with kids. Kid, the same kids who say they hate vegetables, when they grow the vegetable, all of a sudden <laughs> they're so excited about eating what they grew. Uh, the, the issue of uh, poor taste seems no longer to be a barrier. Great. Well, I think this wraps it up for our webinar today. So I want to thank you, Dr. McCarthy, for um, giving us your time today. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank and you so much for giving me this opportunity. Of course. And for our listeners, if you have missed any of our previous webinars, you can find them at the Fielding School of Public Health's website. And that website is ph.ucla. Edu, and they are all archived there. Um, please allow a few days for this one to be posted. And we'll keep in touch about our next webinar, which will be at the beginning of the coming academic year in the fall. If you have any recommendations for future webinar topics that you'd like to see, please email, email us. And you can email us at the address publichealth at support.ucla.edu. And one more time, that's publichealth, one word, at support ucla.edu, and we'd be really interested to hear suggestions. So thank you, everybody.